Welcome to Governance Training for CRCs. I'm Andrew Huffer and today I'm joined by John Denton. Welcome back, John. Well, good day, Andrew. It's good to be here. Fantastic. And today we have on board with us Gordon Marwick, who's the chair of the York CRC. Welcome aboard, Gordon. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, John. Um, Gordon, you're a local farmer, been around York for a wee while. Um, some say too long, yes. <laughs> I wouldn't <laughs> believe that. And um, also, you've got a, a fair experience in being a chair of a number of groups, having been on the, uh, the York Shire for quite a while, and recently come in as chair of the York CRC in the last couple of years. Yes, um, Andrew, I've been in York. I'm fourth generation of my family in York, and uh, I've been actively involved in most community organisations, I guess, over the last 40 odd years, including Football Club, where I'm a life member of the York Football Club. Um, I'm a Justice of the Peace, and I spend time doing lots of uh, signings and authorisations and sit in the court in Northern when I'm required. I'm a freeman of the Shire of York, and I think we've only got three living freemen at the moment. Um, I've previously been a Shire President at York, and a councillor for 12 years. And I was recruited by the York CRC because they thought they needed someone with leadership. So I was asked to come in and I've been here nearly two years and thoroughly enjoyed the experience. We're looking forward to really, um, I guess, drawing that experience today, Gordon, to talk about uh, board performance, which is our episode today. So we're into episode seven of the 10 episode program. And today we've got a lot on offer. So I just want to recap about episode six when we talked about team development. We talked about performance coaching, how to get the best out of your uh, staff members. And also we talked about succession planning. How do we make sure that we're going to have the team we need on your board when people move along? We also talked about the recruitment process for staff. What do we need to have in place to make sure we get the right person the first time? And also managing staff. What are the critical things we need to have in place to ensure we're getting the best of our, out of our staff on board. Let's move along to today's episode, episode seven, board performance. John's gonna take you through uh, developing a skills profile for your board members. We'll also talk about how to make sure we get everyone involved in contributing actively to meetings to get the most from them. And we'll also talk about board leadership, what you really need your chairs to be doing to make sure that everyone's working together. And finally, we'll be looking at assessing board performance and the induction process. How do we get people involved so they really understand where the board's going, what they're trying to achieve and how they're going to go about it. So another action-packed episode. John, if I can hand over to you to take us through looking at the, uh, the skills profile for boards, please. Sure. Thank you, Andrew. The, uh, like any business or organisation, if you're um, going to be successful, then you need to have a good set of skills across all the the members and the board members in the team. So the first thing to think about is um, what skills do you need, what skills do you have and what gaps are there and how can you fill them. That's basically what we're going to be talking about. So the first thing is to think about what skills do we actually need to uh, implement our strategic plan, what skills do the various roles on the board and the, the office bearers need and then go through and have a look, check what skills you've got, and then identify the gaps. Sounds simple, I know, and I know that a lot of boards keep records of what their board members' skills are, but Andrew, I like to, you know, I'm a simple person, I like to put things down uh, on a single sheet, and if I can look at the whole picture on one sheet, then it makes it very easy to make some decisions. So with, whether it's a business or a not-for-profit, I always recommend creating a skills matrix. And I'll show you an a example of that. So this is a very, obviously a very simplified version, but I think it'll show people exactly how to go about it. So down the left-hand side on a spreadsheet, put down all the uh, positions on the board. The office bearers obviously would go down there first as the chairperson, treasurer, secretary, and so on and then any other roles that our, uh, people take on the board. And across the top, on the horizontal axis, put the skills that are required. Think of all the skills, and it's a good idea to brainstorm this with the board. Come up with all the skills that are required, and then on a matrix basis, have a look along each person that you've got on the board and see 
what level of skill they've got in that area. So for example, uh, the treasurer obviously would need good financial reporting skills. So in the box where it says treasurer and financial reporting, then you put the skill that's required, high, and then the skill that the current board member has, high, medium, or low. So that's the one in the brackets, the, the current one? Yep. Okay. Yeah, the one in the brackets is the one that they've currently got. Gotcha. And then, and if you uh, do it in colour as I've done here, then you can very quickly, as a board, you can look at the skills matrix and you can see where you're strong, where you're weak, and some, where some of the gaps are. Yep. And then, of course, you can identify training and upskilling and so on. And then later on, when you're recruiting to the board again, you can, or if somebody leaves the board, you can immediately see what sort of skills you need to fill the gaps. And of course, again, with succession planning, uh, if you've got a matrix like that, then you can quickly see when you're planning down the track uh, what sort of people you need to bring onto the board. Um, Gordon, give us some sort of idea of how this works in practice in, in York, please. Well, I like the idea of the matrix. In the ideal world, you can't always get the people you want, and particularly in smaller CRCs or smaller organisations. We tend to have to work with the people that we are given from our membership base. Um, but I think if we do go out and behind the scenes and, and actively recruit people that have, as you say, financial skills or a good background in finances, those people can be brought on with a little bit of persuasion. And I think the other thing that we need to look at is if your organisation is running well um, and doesn't have any hiccups, you'll find that people will come and join your board because they know you're, you're a fun place to be. Um, you are being seen in the community as doing things. And I think that will lead on then to other good experienced people joining your board because they can see that you are moving forward. And people ask me why should they join the CRC and I just say to them that the CRC is a glue that holds a community together and, and in, in York's case we see ourselves being that glue that pulls all the community groups together. Um, with succession planning I think that we need to identify the skills as we've done of our members and go out and look for additional skills when they are required. Thanks Gordon, that's um, really good input. And sure, you can't always get exactly what you want when it comes to recruiting skills, particularly in small communities. But at least there, by putting the people onto a matrix, you can see where people can be grown and, and trained. And as you were saying, this is a, an incentive for them to come onto the board as well, is because they're going to learn those additional skills and get the training. So they're developing themselves. And, you know, succession planning is a key part of what the board needs to be doing and finding the right people again is crucial or developing the people into the different roles. Attracting them, any thoughts on how you persuade people to come onto board, Sandra or Gordon, in terms of getting them to, to volunteer or? Uh, for me I, I think it really comes into to Gordon's point talking about I guess making sure people see that the CRC is an enjoyable place to be and being on the committee is something worthwhile and it's not just sitting around having cups of tea. Um, and I think, you know, and again, Gordon alluded to this pretty well and I'd like to reinforce it. It's for people to come in with a set of skills, but knowing that they'll come off the board with another set of skills that's gonna help take them further. And we talked about it in the previous episode that that's probably one of the critical areas that people can see that this is gonna be not only an area to um, help serve their community, but also an area for them to de develop themselves. So we're really tapping into that that with them, the, the what's in it for me. And I think once people see that opportunity, um, they, can, they can see themselves going forward and they couldn't. And we remember in our last episode when we were talking to uh, Lisa from the Meriden CRC, she was talking about how much the skill she's developed whilst being chair of the CRC there has helped her in her, her own business and taking that business forward and looking at that from a different perspective. So to me, Gordon, I think you're really on the mark with getting people to see that the CRC is a valuable place to be on the committee and also that you're going to develop your own skills that will take you forward, whether it be in, in business or community life, a bit further. But Can I just also mention that I did go to the Bustleton Conference, um, CRC Conference in 2012, and that opened my eyes up to see the passion that people in the CRC network actually had. And 
to feed off those people some of their ideas, what they do back in their communities. I could bring back to my community and make us a better CRC and it's all part of the network and um, you know I think making it a fun place to be, bringing your experience to the table and passing that on is a great way of attracting and recruiting new people. Yeah and like I've recently read the the latest CRC newsletter, the, the quarterly one and, and the things that people are doing, it's really exciting work and you sort of you can see that there's things happening out there right across the state and you're thinking wow you know this is just a good network to be part of and to, to jump on that bandwagon. Yeah, so people as generally like to give back to the community and feel they're contributing something. So um, this is a really good way to, to get people attracted towards the CRC and being, being part of the board and the bigger picture. The important thing, of course, when you do get people onto the board is to make sure that they've got a very clear understanding of what their role is. And also, we're going to be talking about measurement in a little while, so being clear on what their role is and what's expected of them, but also how they're going to be measured uh, in that role and, and developed as well. So one of the key things, of course, that board members do is they have meetings, Andrew. Fantastic. And uh, you're going to take us through and explain a little bit more about how to get board members to be effective in those meetings. Absolutely. And, and certainly a lot of the work I do with, with other groups and, and not-for-profits, a lot of the members spend a lot of, as you said, John, a lot of their time in their meet in meetings. It's probably one of their primary roles. So, I think it's it's worthwhile to try and make them as as valuable for all members as possible. And and where some of the research I've seen says the frustrations happen where meetings aren't run effectively, and that's what actually keeps people away from joining committees and boards. They mm. see these meetings that go on forever. People are reading reports, and it's like oh, I'd rather have a bath and hot fat than, than go to another one of these meetings. So, so I think there's some, some, some basic things we can have in place that will help boards to make sure that they've really got uh, an effective process. And we talked about this in previous episodes and making meetings work, but it's good again just to reinforce that. I guess in terms of making sure there's transparency there, that right from the start that, that conflict of interest issue is dealt with right up front. And there can be a whole host of issues relating to conflict of interest. In CRCs, a lot of it's related to um, employee relationships. There could be, uh, especially in small towns, it could be a, a, a relative or distant relative employed. So that transparency really needs to be in place to show that there has been, that if you are in any way connected to people along those lines, or even if you, you're connected to a business that may benefit from dealing with the CRC, that that's clearly outlined right from the start. And Gordon, I know in local government, um, you've had to deal with this all the time in making sure that this conflict of interest stuff is right on the table right from the start, earlier on. Yeah, Andrew, it must be brought up at the start of the meeting and I always had a motto in local government, if in doubt, get out. Um, if you've got any close association with any issue that may be discussed, just leave the room. It, it's uh, no skin off your nose. It, it, it makes a very clear definition of where you are on the issue and just leave the room and it makes it easier for everybody. The point I'd like to make on that, Andrew, as well, is that it's not just if you know you've got a conflict of interest, but if you think that there will be a perceived conflict of interest uh, in other people's eyes, you know, they may see a, perceive a conflict of interest uh, where you don't, but then that needs to be declared as well. And any time you read in the media about state and federal politics, that's where any opponent's always looking for an angle, is trying to twist the knife there of any perception of conflict of interest, even if it's not real. So I think it's always worthwhile making sure your, your, your table's clean that way and, and people know what's going on. Uh, the other part we've talked about is, is just simple things like an attendance register to make sure that um, it's quite clear who's turning up and when and, and that they're actually meeting the requirements of the constitution. And, and a lot of constitutions will have, if um, you don't tend I tend to think it's three meetings in a row then there's grounds there for to review your membership on the committee and board and, and see if that's still valid. John, do you have something to add to that? I think it's very important that um, board members know that they're, they are required to attend the meetings, they know when the meetings are going to be. So again, I find from my experience is that every, if all the meetings are scheduled through for at least a year in advance, then people are more likely to be able to attend them. It's when things are uh, done quickly or at short notice, then you get poor attendance. 
but they need to know that attending meetings is part of their role and if they can't get there then to give their apologies and nominate a proxy and not just not show up that's the worst thing Andrew that can happen. It's interesting you mentioned that that the short notice issue can be an issue. Um, Gordon, you've got quite a large committee. I think there's about 11 or 12 people on it in total. But I believe you, you've, you've put in, I guess, a plan B for dealing with things at short notice through an executive structure? Yeah, we have an executive meeting of myself as a chairman and our vice chairman, our secretary and our treasurer. And the issues that do come up at short notice, we can deal with those issues um, there and then. Um, and usually, if it's, a, if it's a really major issue, we'll do a phone ring around once the executive committee have come up with a solution to the problem and they follow up by an email. And of course, that's the decision made by the executive is always retrospectively supported at the next monthly meeting. So it must be recorded. Um, and we've, we just find that is a good way of dealing with the day-to-day -day stuff that comes up out of the blue. Um, because we can't always get our committee together at a minute's notice to meet um, to deal with these issues. And it works very well for us. Yes, and something that we use on a committee that I'm on, Andrew, is a, an online system, which is a confidential uh, forum or project type system yep. that you would be familiar with as well, where if decisions need to be made quickly, then everybody can get involved and very quickly uh, read any mat material and make some decisions and make a vote if necessary as well. Um, so there's a number of ways you can cover that off and it also overcomes the tyranny of distance as well. Yeah, and like I said, online, you can use some of the, the online video conferencing um, platforms that are around there for free now and that can be another way if you need the whole committee endorsement straight away, you can just do a quick hookup through either Google or Skype or whichever one you need and, and get people together so at least they understand what's happening and, and the decision that needs to be considered. Hmm. Um, let's talk about some of the other issues in terms of making sure your meetings are really on track and effective is to is actually to bring people in to do presentations to the to the board and the committee and certainly when I've been involved in a, an exec officer role it, it's a really great way to make sure people understand the role of your CRC in getting people to come and present to you about what they're doing and also for them to really get a clear picture of how the CRC can assist them and, and develop those relationships. So I think you can do that either by having people come to you or you go to their meetings and also through having um, staff members present to your meetings to give you updates. So it's really clear what's happening with the staff, it's really clear what's happening with um, some of your key stakeholders around town and, and how they can assist. I, I do believe that there are some CRCs um, have a structure where they'll have an ESCI meeting if you'd like for a better word where they'd have They'd call their stakeholders in for a, a sundowner and have a few sandwiches and have a few cool drinks and just talk to them about issues that may they may like to bring up that we can take back to the committee. Um, and I think it's just important that we, we keep abreast of our members and their requirements and their needs so that we can deal with those issues for them. It doesn't actually have to be a, a formal type presentation, it can be that informal way. Yeah, informal, as long as the message is put out there and it goes back to the board, we can deal with it. With one of the associations, business associations I belong to, we regularly get the Shire to bring uh, members in, uh, to bring people in and sit in on some of our meetings and occasionally to present to the meeting as well where they would like input from the business community back to them. So I think the more you have that stakeholder engagement, the better really, then people can see what's happening and what you're doing for them. Absolutely, and I think that's an important point, what you're doing for them, it comes back to that what's in it for me, and so if people can see some advantage there or some potential opportunity through a collaborative approach, maybe it's with funding or a project, then, then I think there's some, some chances there to really take things forward. Um, the other thing I think it's worth talking about too when the board does get together is getting some agreement on, um, I guess the reward for board members, we talked about they're developing their skills. Um, and whether there's opportunities that boards should, board members should be remunerated perhaps for their travel if they're having to go, like you mentioned before, Gordon, going to, to Bustleton. And I know you travel quite a bit to Perth in your role. So I, think, I, don't, I don't think it necessarily should be an assumption that all board members are remunerated for either their time or their travel. But I think it, at least a conversation should occur so everyone's clear on what's in and what's out. It's just so 
and I think it's worthwhile so board members don't see themselves as being, I guess, always called, called upon and their resources are being, I guess, drawn out through being, through their role. My belief is that if you join these local committees and like CRC, you do it because you have a passion for your community. You don't necessarily do it before the remuneration. However, if you are out of pocket, there should be some avenue where you can reclaim those expenses. But, uh, uh, you know, even going back to why people stand or make themselves available for a board, you've got to have the passion and the desire within to serve your community the best way you can. And I don't always agree with the local government concept where you are being now paid to be a councillor. Um, you need to do it because you have a passion and you want to see your, your community thrive and go forward. However, I do understand that not everyone can afford that option. So if there is an avenue there where you can claim your expenses, then I think it's pretty good. I guess it's a bit of the uh, JFK thing, isn't it? Don't, don't ask what your CRC can do for you, but ask what you can do for your CRC. Gordon, I agree, it's about what you're going to give. Undoubtedly, I think there are things that come back to you as well in terms of perks and, you know, I know I've been to some conferences, I've been to some very interesting meetings and things that I wouldn't otherwise have gone to if I wasn't on the board of that particular association. So it's, um, yeah, swings and roundabouts, I guess. But yeah, I think that conversation is a really good leading to our, our next topic, to think about, to really start thinking about the, the leadership role in the board and, and give some thought to what can we do as, especially, you know, I'm going to put the weights on here, here on you, Gordon, what can you do as a, a chair in terms of inspiring people to lead the way and to really I guess get people to see that this is an important role, this is how I do it as a chairman, and this is what I'm expecting of, of you as board members. To me, John, you mentioned inspiration is an important thing to you. You've just mentioned the, the JFK quote. How do you see inspiration coming through in a, in a board chair? I think it's the vision, you know, a visionary. I think all good leaders are visionaries, and it's their vision, vision and the communication of that vision that inspires everybody else to rally behind them and do what their role requires and do what the team requires for the success of the team. Again, another one of my favourite quotes is that, you know, a good leader has his eye on the horizon but his hand on the wheel. So he sees the big picture, he knows where the, the long-term future is, but on the other hand he's got his hand on the wheel, so he's got his uh, a good grasp of the day-to-day -day stuff that's going on. So um, to me that sums up what a good leader is, Andrew. How about for you, Gordon? Well, I have a quote. I'm not too sure who made the quote, but um, if you don't know where you're going, there's a fair chance you'll never get there. A good leader has to lead by example, and I think John mentioned communication. I think that a good leader must be able to communicate with his board and with his CEO, or, or in this case, coordinator, um, and lead by example. And I think you need to have that quality that you can inspire those people around you and have them working for you and with you. And while we're, we're talking, I won't go into quotes, but certainly um, one of the, the favourite people I enjoy reading, back, reading about is um, uh, Shackleton, the, the Arctic explorer. And um, one of the things he was famous for was being, getting people around him, he knew his own strengths, but more importantly as a leader, he knew his weaknesses. So he made sure the people he had around him in his team Fill those weak, fill those gaps, so he can make sure that the team as a whole, even though under his leadership, worked to his strengths. But he also made sure he plugged those weaknesses, so as a team they could achieve their objectives. The other things I think we need to talk would be worth talking through in terms of the inspirational style, um, the, the I guess the examples of leadership, is is the efficiency side of things and making sure you're covered off on that, so that your your board does work effectively and efficiently. I like um, chairs, leaders who are to the point, succinct, don't mess around and get things done. And it makes going to meetings and being involved with them a, a real pleasure because you know that there's going to be no fluff or, or messing around or time wasting. And to me that's so important. When you're offering your time on a voluntary basis, then obviously you want to get the most out of your time and get the most done. So. Having someone leading you who's going to be uh, to the point, organised, structured and get everything done in a, as quick a time as possible, then that's a really good way for a leader to be. 
Gordon? You stole some of my thunder there, John. But I'm sorry. I think also we need to make sure that we structure our meetings at a time that suits everybody. We are actually looking at running some morning breakfast meetings because um, most of the board work and our current time, 4.30 in the afternoon, doesn't suit everybody's needs. So if we can just mix them up a little bit and have some different meetings and, and try a coffee and a croissant meeting in the morning and keep the meetings moving. And a short meeting is a good meeting as long as the points are covered and don't labour on and don't get bogged down. We need to keep the thing flowing, keep it interesting and keep the members happy. I think that brings out a really good point there, Gordon, um, back into succession planning. If you're trying to get new people into the, into the board and committee structure, then, then having the meetings at times that suit working people is going to be a, a, re a real value and more incentive than having the, the evening meetings when people are probably a little bit puffed from the end of the day anyway or have got um, kids and dinner and all that sort of stuff to, to try and deal with. The other thing for me I think is really valuable from a, from a chair and leadership perspective is actually recognising the people around you. Like, as you've both mentioned, everyone in the CRC role is, is there as a volunteer and some, just some little things can make it go a long way in making a difference to, to people's roles on committees and getting them involved. And Simple things as using the T word and saying thanks for, for their involvement and if there's been a say a special achievement then making sure that's recognised within the meeting and that people actually get their what's due to them in terms of the, that thanks and recognition. If you don't thank people there's a fair chance they won't do it again. <laughs> and, and for me like I've said we've got the, the, the cafe business and a simple thing at the end of the day especially if it's been a tough day and, and yesterday we had a pretty tough day we, we had lots of people coming in and they wanted they wanted all sorts of stuff from us breakfast coffee I wanted me to be nice to them all in one day. <laughs> but it was really important for me to make sure I went around and thanked every member of staff for getting us through a tough day. And they walk home with a smile, they're happy, they know they're recognised. And it's just those little things that make a difference that I reckon that keeps people coming back, like Gordon said, to, to want to be part of things in the future. Let's move on. John? So how do we assess the performance of the board? Because, as I've said in plenty of episodes before, if you can't measure it, then how can you improve it? So the first thing is to agree a board evaluation process. Okay, so get together as a board and decide what are the key result areas for the board and how are you going to put some measures in place to see how you're performing on those key areas. And think of it about as in improving the, the value that the board gives to the CRC. It's not about checking up on people or things like that. It's about improving the value that that people contribute to the board and what the board contributes to the CRC. One way that you can measure if you're being effective is to have a governance and operations audit. And for this I recommend that you get somebody from outside, somebody who's external, to come in and go through the policies, the procedures, the whole governance side of things and give you or give the board a report on that. So I don't know if that happens in York, Gordon, does it? It hasn't happened yet but it's going to happen soon. We'll be doing all this, but it, I agree, we can't do a self an audit. We need to bring someone from outside, and there are specialised people that do that, and we will certainly be doing that, as I'm sure most other CRCs do. And again, when, when you're looking at board performance, as well as looking at the overall performance of the board, think about individual performance and performance reviews. And again, it's not about checking up on people or you know, beating them with a big stick. It's about looking at how they can develop and improve and add more, more value. So come up with a way of doing that and doing it on a regular basis, have a schedule um, and decide who and how that's, that's going to be done. For my two bobs worth, when, especially when we've been running training programs and, and we get people to, I guess, display the, some of the training they've put in place, when, when they get that sort of feedback and it's feedback of here are the things, five things you did well, and here are a couple of things just to fine tune and improve for the future. They really take that away and, and see that as quite a valuable experience for them. Especially, actually, interestingly, when they get that in writing, because it's something they can take away, reflect on, think about a bit further, and then think, okay, well, so, well how can I do that now? So it becomes both, um, I guess, a reinforcement of what they're doing well, and also a bit of a challenge for the future that people can, again, to take away to improve their skills for, for other roles in the future. And here's another good, uh 
mantra to have in mind and that is catch people doing something right and tell them. Um, so again, and Gordon mentioned the recognition thing, it's very important that people get recognized and Andrew, you've backed that up. But if you keep that in mind, catch people doing things right and tell them, give them a pat on the back. So it's not all about checking up, but you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to accountability. And if people aren't performing for whatever reason on a consistent basis and they're not responding to training and development, then it may come down to actually removing them from the board. And the constitution allows for that to happen. Have you had any experiences on that front, Andrew or Gordon? Uh, we have actually, and under your policies and procedure manual, there is a section that covers that. Yeah, it's not a pleasant experience, but I guess the other option is because we're in a democratic society, you wait till the AGM and your members remove those people if they know they're not performing. And sometimes it can be an opportunity for that board member too, if, if they've actually, the reason they're not performing well is because they've become overwhelmed with everything that's on or there's other things going on in their lives that don't allow them to provide, I guess, the focus they need to to their board role, then, then maybe this can be an opportunity to say, how, you know, you've, you've probably given as much as you can give at this stage. We think it may be time for someone else to come through the ranks and, and give them the opportunity to experience what you've experienced. Some of the other things that you should be looking at when you're assessing board performance, if we just go through a few of them here, strategic planning. If you've got a strategic plan and you're serious and committed to operating that strategic plan, then you need to be measuring on a regular basis of uh, if actions are being met. So quite often, again, depending upon the character and personalities on the board, uh, some people get very good at planning but never actually get into the, the doing stuff, you know, and nothing happens until there's action. So it's about having a, a good plan, having deadlines and timelines on it and then monitoring to make sure that um, you're working to the plan. So Gordon, how does that happen in York? I know you've got some big plans going on there at the moment. Well, a strategic plan is really a living document and you need to update it regularly and you need to, it's almost like it's your, your Bible for what you carry out within your role of the CRC. You sit down with your, with your board, um, usually have a an external person helping you put the plan together and once your plan is set it's then up to the to the board and the coordinators and the staff to make sure that you adhere to what you have planned to do. Um, I just think it's a great document and I always carry mine with me. Uh, I'm totally with Gordon. I think it's the critical part is it's it's what people call refer to that as a living plan. It's not just something we've gone through the motions of doing and and again, it probably comes back to, the, the, we're talking mantras today is important, and mantras and quotes for today. It's, to me, it's, it's plan quarterly, review weekly, act daily. So I think if you can get into that sort of process, then I think that can really help a board to think that this is an active process, not something that we're just doing because we've got to do it. Of course, the other thing that the board needs to do is make sure that compliance is met as far as meeting key dates and legislative uh, deadlines, de uh, dates and things like that. So again, it's something that's fairly simple to to monitor and measure because generally if you don't meet them, you get a fine. So uh, there's a consequence for not, not meeting those. And something that often gets overlooked is reviewing policies. Again, policies and procedures are critical to any operation, be it not-for-profit or a business. And making sure that your policies and procedures are up to date is a matter of reviewing them on a regular basis and uh, a classic one is um, I mean policies do change and laws change so for example the privacy policy changed recently at the beginning of this year and I wonder how many organizations and CRC's have actually reviewed their privacy policy to make sure that it meets the legislation um, any thoughts on uh, policy and procedure reviews Gordon we have a subcommittee that um is ongoing reviewing our policies. Um, they meet probably three times a year and, and look for updates, look for deficiencies that might need strengthening and they bring those reviews back to the board and the board usually endorses it. Okay, fantastic. Use a subcommittee to do those sort of reviews. Again, another key measure is to make sure that 
the CIC is moving towards its, its vision and mission. And review the progress and check on it and discuss it as a board and uh, make sure that it all ties in with the strategic plan. So a few other things which are fairly simple and you would think fairly obvious checks to do when measuring the, the performance of the board, but they can get overlooked. Things like treasurer's reports. Making sure that the treasurer's reports are produced on time, that they're circulated preferably to the board before a meeting, and that the treasurer has, or the financial subcommittee if there is one, have actually come up with uh, some meaning from the numbers and not just presenting the numbers, what it's actually telling the board about the state of the business. Um, anything you'd like to tell us about that, Gordon? Well, of course, they must be accurate as well, John. <laughs> well, hopefully, yeah. We need to keep a constant eye on our finances and to have a good treasurer that can look beyond and report to the committee that we may have something coming up in two months' time. We need to be prepared for that financially. Um, as long as we are forewarned, we're forearmed. And um, as long as the figures are accurate, I think it's, uh, it's the way to go. Hmm. Accurate and interpreted well. Andrew? I think part of it would help too in the way that what's presented. I think if there's any issues that need to be flagged, then it's worthwhile making sure the actual presentation of the report makes that clear. And it could be just something as simple as key points, and this is where we are in terms of our, say, our projected profit and loss for the year. Um, it, it could be this is where we are in terms of our projected reserve we want to have in place for the year when we talk about some of the issues that come out in episode four and previous episodes. So to me, it helps make financials simple for people who are non-financial, just having something like that, key points of the report. And also, John, I think it needs to be out there to the board um, perhaps a week before your meeting so that you do have a chance to, to go through the figures yourself in your own time before you come to the meeting. I absolutely agree. That's uh, the prior preparation and planning preventing pretty poor performance. You know, the, if all this stuff is circulated to the board before the meeting, then the meetings can be a lot quicker, a lot more succinct and a lot more effective. And talking of the meetings and after the meeting, it's getting the minutes of the meeting out. Um, it really frustrates me sometimes when I'm involved in a, in a committee or a board and the minutes don't come out until the night before the next meeting, to me, which is almost useless uh, because the minutes document actions by whom, by when. Um, do you have a strategy for getting the minutes out on time, Gordon? We have a strategy. I'm not saying it always works. Um, we have a secretary that takes the minutes through our meeting. Um, she normally sends them to me the next day or the day after for me to peruse and just to check if there's any things she may have missed out on. Um, and then they go off to the coordinator who then puts them together in a proper format that gets sent out to our members prior to the meeting. Absolutely. So they need to be accurate. And I mean, you, you can't stress that enough. These minutes are a, a true record of the meeting that took place and they must be recorded as such. I always say don't make the minutes war and peace. You know, it doesn't have to quote every single word that was said in the meeting. It needs to make the points that were made, um, any motions that were moved and any actions that are due as a result. So any tips on that side, Andrew? Or? I think you got it pretty well covered, but the action part I think is a pretty important thing. And even just a table of those, the actions you've probably you've referred to previously, it's this, the who, what, when and how is going to happen. And I think that's, that's a good thing because one of the things I first look for when I see um, anything come out of a meeting with the action list is my initials or name on it and knowing <laughs> that, all right, <laughs> something up to you here, something that you've got to do here, buddy, so get, your, get into action and get it, get it happening. Probably the other thing I'd, I'd put in place too in terms of getting things out on time is getting people into the habit of, of setting themselves deadlines so they know that by this time I have to have this task done, this time I have to have this task done with it. It's getting the minutes uh, written up then approved and then distributed. So you're actually working to those deadlines so you're making sure you're on track and it's not that, that last minute, oh my God, panic <laughs> approach. Yes, and I think that goes with everything that the, the board does. There should be a schedule and a calendar, you know, a rolling 12 month calendar at least so that everybody knows what's coming up. You can plan around it and then, you know, people, there's no surprises. Yeah, and I think, you know, you referred to earlier about these online platforms that 
that um, that boards and committees can have, so they have a lot of their key documents stored there. A lot of them nowadays have a calendar there as well, so you can actually see when key meetings are, when things need to be done, what you're aiming for, and they're just a great central reference tool that anyone who's logged into the internet thing can just hook into there and quickly get it in a snap. And I think we've already covered this, but you know, action plans and follow-ups from minutes are critical, and as you said, Andrew, I know you try to avoid getting your initials against the actions on these minutes, but at the end of the day, you can measure how many of the actions actually get completed on time, and that's a good uh, assessment of the board performance as well. Yeah, and to me that can come back to the earlier area when we talked about recognition. I think that's a good way for, for the chair to recognise when board members do take their undertake their tasks in a timely manner, and staff as well. And for me, it's always satisfying to get something done ahead of schedule in place saying, yep, done my bit and let's keep moving forward. I want to talk about induction processes now. So we've, we've talked about all the, I guess, the incentive type approaches to get people involved in boards and committees and, and really um, committed to what they're doing. So I think part of it is, is making a two-way process by saying, well, we're committed to you as a new board and committee member. And I think having a, that solid induction process uh, really helps. And Gordon, you talked earlier about um, having the policy manual and procedures in place that you provide to new people coming on board. And that sounds to me like a really, really good way for, to get people clear on what you're trying to achieve and, and, and how you operate. Yeah, and we also encourage them to read it <laughs> as well and take note. Yeah, now look, the policy and procedure manual is, is laid out by the board and that's, that's our direction. We also have an induction kit which comes um, included in that kit as a confidentiality form which they must sign. Um, that of course covers the board, staff members and of course our clients that use our services. And I think that's where you're really ahead of the game with that to make sure that everyone's quite clear and to me it's important before they even start their first meeting that this is all, all happening. Um, so to me, the, the purpose of the whole induction process is really to be able to make sure that, that new members know that there's practical support available to them, um, that it's a good way to get them involved into the, into the team so they can see how they fit. And John mentioned earlier about understanding their roles, it's important for that. And I think it also helps build relationships within a committee and that they become, uh, well, well, committed to what you're trying to achieve because they can see the people around them are uh, taking that on that kind of behaviour. And, and Gordon, again, you mentioned earlier how you went to the, the conference at Bustleton. You could see the energy and the excitement about people involved in CRCs. And so I think if, if people can be feel welcomed into an organisation and see that energy and commitment, then it's just going to be infectious and they'll take it on as well. Yeah, dead right. I, I was just blown away by the enthusiasm that I, I come across at Bustleton and, you know, to see how the rest of the CRC networks work. Um, also, I, I think a couple of little sundowners don't do any harm through the year, to, um, particularly when you have new members come on board, uh, and, new, and new board members, and your, your members. Uh, little sundowners just to help break the ice and, and talking around a beer sometimes, people come out and say what they really mean about the issues and what they really want. It's a lot better than having to put it formally in a letter or um, a phone call that sometimes gets misinterpreted. So I think any contact you have with your members is beneficial to the organisation. And the other thing I think it, it helps with is it, it keeps people keen to be part of your uh, board and committee. If they, if they can see that they're, they're valued and they're given the right information and they see how other people are operating. And, and Gordon, you said it right from the start of the episode today, it creates, I guess, an environment where people want to be rather than feeling they have to be to, as part of sort of a service type mm. guilt that it's actually they think, oh, I really enjoy being part of this group. It's something that the induction is often overlooked or not done um, thoroughly. I, my view on this is to have an induction kit which contains all the things that a new member needs to know about the CRC itself and what its mission is, who its stakeholders are, who its clients are, and 
Also, a, a summary of the Constitution, the key points in the summary. We mentioned this in a previous episode, but the things that um, that come up, like how many people constitute, how many attendees at a meeting constitutes a quorum, um, various things like that, just summarise those key points into a, an induction booklet or a board member handbook, call it. But have that sort of kit and a process well defined. Know who's going to do the induction, when, what it's going to include, and certainly the social side of it is a is a good way to go, Gordon. Definitely, that's a really good leading to, to to think about that induction. What I call a almost like a timeline. So, people come when they when you've got a new board member coming on board. Think about the critical things you need to have in place, and when you and you've just mentioned quite a few of them there, which is fantastic. Is to me the important part is what are you going to do beforehand, rather than leaving it to the last minute where people are a bit confused at the first meeting and thinking, well, what, what is going on here? That they're coming in ready, understanding their role, clear on what the organisation's about and, and how it operates. Um, and I think, you know, by that first meeting, that if you've done all that pre-work, I think that's going to have them well positioned to work effectively as a board member. And, and one thing I'd like to pick up on that is perhaps thinking about could you assign almost like a buddy or mentor type person from within the existing committee to, to help them through that process so that they can can work with and maybe give a call to to say this is how this is how we do things here. Absolutely a mentor is a key part of it as well. Having somebody that can give the benefit of their experience and coach the person um, when they come on board is just uh, vital I think. And to me I think it's also by the time in, the, in that first meeting they can the, the board member can possibly go delve a bit deeper in terms of how the group's operating maybe understanding a bit better about some of the key relationships perhaps with funding funders and and find out a bit more from that perspective so right from the start they can also add value by asking some good questions of existing board members as well coming there about some of those areas rather than having to worry about all the, the operational stuff which should already be clear the other areas to to be thinking about is what what do we, what do we want this person to be up to speed with in in the first month so John, you referred to earlier about the, the skills audit. To me, that's worthwhile getting to, um, to spend some time with your new board member in that first month to think about some of those skills where they want to maybe fine tune and, and work upon. Um, and have a bit of time to have a chat with the board member about their perceptions of the first month being involved in this committee and, and what they've seen, what they've liked, and perhaps what have been some of the things they've maybe even got some concerns about. I also see that as a role of the of the leadership group to to uh, prepare these people to hit the ground running once they've come in, and you know as a, as a chairman, I guess that's one of the roles that the chairman should be doing in that period of time from when they are elected to be on the board to when they attend their first meeting. Um, it gets them up to speed, so they hit the ground running, and um, they mightn't be as switched on as the rest of the committee from day one, but it certainly helps them get acclimatised and come there in a friendly environment and feel comfortable with the people they're with. And my other time frame is in that, in the, within that first quarter, is, is really making sure that everyone's quite clear on what that person is actually going to deliver and add value to now, in the, now that they've been within the organisation for that period of time. So it's really not something that's left till later and not talked about. Yeah, I think the first quarter is a good time to basically do the first performance review with the person and get their feedback on how they think things have gone and what could have been done better but to sort of review their role uh, what outcomes they're producing and how they've gone so far so it's a bit of feedback both ways I think the first quarter is a good time to do that. Absolutely and, and I know John on boards you've been involved in sometimes that hasn't happened and, and so for you as a new board member, you're probably thinking, mm, where's this really going to go? And, and my guess is you'd be wondering, should I really stay involved? Well, that's right. You start to think um, exactly why am I here and what is it that I'm supposed to be contributing? I mean, you shouldn't let it get to that point, but you can sometimes drift into that situation just because there hasn't been that leadership and, and follow-up. To take Gordon's point about it comes down to the leadership. You betcha. So let's have a, a look at a couple of, I guess, tips to help you in thinking about the performance of the board. Um, John mentioned earlier right from the start about knowing what skills we need to operate well as a board. 
and then trying to work out a way to start developing them. We also talked about the importance of having a succession plan. We keep reinforcing that all the way through. And, and Gordon, you mentioned it's not always easy to get the, the people you want, especially in smaller communities, but it's worth working hard to, I guess, create an environment that people want to be in so they stay there and actually starts to draw people in because they see what value you're providing as a committee, but also what skills you're developing whilst you're on there. John, this is one of your mantras. It's, it's always being on the lookout for, for valuable people or people that can, can assist you, your board or committee. For sure, that's uh, true in business as well. I tell my clients they should always be looking for uh, good people out there to, to bring on board and to have them in the wings ready when, you know, don't let it become a crisis. And we just talked now about the, the value of um, having a good induction process and having that mentoring in place so people feel like they've got somebody to work with who can, can help them through getting through that, that first day of school type complex. Other quick tips, we talked about the need for keeping board members accountable and making sure they're clear on their role, what they're expected to deliver and, and having that on, honest conversation about when they are delivering and if they're not delivering, there needs to be an out clause and whether that's a, a voluntary one or whether it's one that has to be a tough decision and saying, well, thanks for coming, then now it's time, yeah, your time in the episode is now over. We talked also about the importance of uh, the leadership qualities of, of chair people here and the importance that they provide that inspiration, direction and the, the real vision of this is where, where we're going as an organisation and here's what we're trying to achieve and, and this is the way it's done around here. And we just also finish off talking a bit about assessing board performance. What are some of the key measures and indicators to make sure that you really are hitting the mark and, 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 and setting the, I guess, the standard for performance. And of course, if, if you're looking for further assessment tools, if you go to management support online, there's a whole host of really valuable, again, practical tools that you can use to help in all of these areas of board performance. Here are just a few that we recommend that are most relevant to today's episode. So to me, make sure you get onto MSO. Um, see what's there and available to you and make sure you use it just to make your job job easier. Um, really I encourage you to look at what are the three big things that you want to apply from this episode to make sure you're getting real value from this into your governance plan. Next week in episode eight we're going to be talking about confidentiality. I can't really talk about it right now so we have to watch episode eight. <laughs> um, thanks very much John for joining us again Really appreciate the insight and value you've provided today. Pleasure as always, Andrew. Great to be here. Wonderful. And a super big thank you for Gordon for coming in from York today and sharing your experiences and really helping us with the, the practical side of making sure that boards are perform performing well. So thanks again, Gordon. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, John. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next time on, for Episode 8. We're talking about confidentiality. See you then. Shh.